Boeing 737 is approaching a snowy runway in Chicago. Both of the pilots are aware of the tricky conditions on the ground and they're expecting a slippery landing. As they touch down, they apply the brakes, but to their horror, they realize that nothing is happening. The aircraft is not decelerating. What's going on? Stay tuned. In the afternoon of the 8th of December 2005, two pilots from Southwest Airlines were intently looking into their briefing material. They were planned together for three flights on that day, and the weather outside was absolutely horrendous. The first leg of their flight was going to take them from Baltimore over towards Chicago Midway Airport, and in Chicago it was expected an area of intense snowfall during the afternoon and evening. This snowfall could potentially lead to low visibility procedures in Chicago and also some quite slippery runways. So the pilots had to be very careful with how much fuel they were going to take. They decided eventually to nominate two different alternates so that even if the weather would not hold up in Chicago, they knew that they could go to at least the furthest of those two alternates. And on top of that, they took 90 minutes of extra fuel so that they could end up in a holding in case there was snow clearing needed in Chicago. Both of the pilots who are going to operate these flights are very experienced. The captain is 59 years old, he has close to 15,000 hours of total time, and out of those he has operated 4,500 hours on the Boeing 737 that they are going to be using for this flight. Prior to joining Southwest, he had been working 26 years within the US Air Force. He was joined by a 34-year-old first officer who had 8,500 hours of total time, 2,000 hours on the Boeing 737, and prior to that he'd been operating as a captain on the Saab 340 for several thousand hours. Once the pilots had finished their pre-flight preparation, they went out, they briefed their three cabin crew members that they're going to be operating together with, and then they made their way out to the aircraft and started boarding their 103 passengers that were scheduled for this flight over to Chicago. Now the weather in Baltimore was also really really bad, which led to a lot of delays before the aircraft could start pushing. And during these ground delays, the captain set up for the departure, he was going to be pilot flying for this flight, and while they were waiting, they started discussing this new procedure that Southwest was about to implement. This new procedure had to do with the auto brake system that was fitted to the 737-700 that they were going to fly, and the auto brake system is exactly what it sounds like. It is a system that automatically applies braking and gives a consistent deceleration rate to the aircraft. It is controlled by a selector knob which can be set to either RTO, which stands for rejected takeoff. In that setting it will help the pilots to apply maximum braking in case they decide to reject the takeoff. And then it can be set to four different landing settings from 1, 2, 3 to max. This system had always been available on the 737-700, but it hadn't been used for landing in Southwest up until this point. And the reason for that was because they were operating some earlier 737 types that did not have it. And because they wanted to have conformity in the ways that the pilots were operating each of these 737 types, they hadn't used it. But now the whole fleet was fitted with it, so now it was time to implement the use of this system. And the implementation of this new procedure had been delayed several times by the company. In fact, unbeknownst to the pilots on this day, it had actually been delayed once again. But the pilots that were going to fly this flight were convinced that on this date they were going to start using this new outer brake procedure. The ground delay just kept getting longer and longer until it eventually reached almost two hours. At time 1758, the pilots finally received pushback clearance from their gates. They pushed back, started their engines and started taxiing out for a departure from with 28 in Baltimore. The aircraft took off normally, climbed up to initially 33,000 feet and then received further climb clearance to their final cruising altitude of 39,000 feet. Once the crew had established themselves in cruise, they almost immediately started taking weather through their ACAR system for their arrival into Chicago Midway. The weather was, as expected, really, really bad, with a surface wind of 0, 09 and 0 degrees at 10 knots, 800 meters of visibility in heavy snow and freezing fog, and a temperature of minus 4 degrees. Additional to the weather, they also got a report about the runway state, as in the condition on the runway that they could expect when they landed. This report was a bit mixed, where they said that the braking action they can expect was fair in the first half of the runway and poor the second half. 
The support had been given by landing aircraft who had been given their assessment, but also by the crews who were cleaning the runway and taking braking measurements. It's really important for pilots to be aware of the runway state, the braking action on the runway that they're about to land on. Not only because it's important to know that you can actually stop in the available runway, but also because it's going to affect the amount of crosswind and tailwind that you can accept. Now you are probably going to be asking yourself, tailwind, who is going to be landing an aircraft on a slippery runway in tailwind? Why not just fly around the land from the opposite direction where you have headwind instead? And that would be a really good question. But the problem that existed in Chicago Midway was that they had ILS approaches from both directions, both into runway 31 center and into runway 13 center. But the problem was that the visibility requirement was needed for runway 13 center was slightly higher than from the other direction. And with the kind of weather conditions that they were facing on this day, the visibility was not good enough to actually do the ILS from runway 13, which would have had a headwind component. So they were forced to, if they were going to do an approach at all into midway, they would have to do it into runway 31 center instead. Both of the pilots started looking at this and they realized that they were looking at a tailwind of approximately eight knots. Now in the Southwest manual, they were allowed to land on a runway with up to 10 knots of tailwind, provided that they could land within the available runway. That was only available unless the runway had poor braking action. If the braking action was poor, the limitation was actually five knots. The pilots discussed this, they were not very happy with it, but the way that they reasoned was that, well, the first part of the runway has fair and the second part is poor, and since there was a mix of different braking actions, we can probably take 10 knots of tailwind. We need the whole runway to be poor in order for the five knot tailwind limitation to apply. If they would have gone into the manuals, they would have noticed that the Southwest performance manual actually stated that they needed to use the most conservative value, which in this case was poor. And if it was poor braking action reported at any part of the runway, the five knot tailwind restriction applied. Once the crew had decided that they were allowed to use 10 knots of tailwind, they now needed to do a calculation to see that they could actually stop the aircraft within the available runway distance. And in order to do so, they used a computer that was stored behind the captain's seat called an OPC, an onboard performance computer. This computer used performance data from Boeing and from some other sources as well, together with the inputted parameters by the crew of, for example, the braking action, the wind components, the pressure, uh, temperature, and so on. And it then spit out the runway distance they would need in order to stop. And here we get to a really crucial part of this accident, because back in 2005, the FAA had not mandated the operators, the airlines, to do an in-flight performance calculation prior to landing. They were mandated to do a performance calculation to make sure that they could land prior to departure, but once they were airborne, it was up to each operator to do a performance calculation. And because there was no set rules on how to do this, all of the operators did it in different ways. And some operators actually didn't do it at all, which I find incredible. In the case of Southwest Airlines, they had created this OPC tool, but they had not used only Boeing performance figures. They'd actually used some third-party performance figures as well, which turned out to be less conservative than the Boeing figures. On top of that, this computer also limited the amount of tailwind that it could use during its calculation when the braking action was reported to poor to five knots. So when the pilots inputted eight knots of tailwind into the computer, the computer then defaulted it back to five knots because that was the maximum tailwind that they were allowed to use on poor braking action. This, however, was likely not noticed by the crew. Because when the crew did this calculation, they came up with that with poor braking action, they would be able to stop the aircraft within the available runway, but with only 40 feet to spare toward the end of the runway. Now, this made both pilots very uneasy, but they started discussing it and they both agreed that since the first part of the runway was fair, and the second part was poor, it meant that doing the calculation for the whole runway as being poor was giving them a little bit of margin. And on top of this, the earlier Boeing 737 models in the Southwest fleet did not use thrust reverse as part of their landing calculations. 
This meant that the thrust reverser, if being used, was basically extra, so that the performance calculations that they got out was always on the conservative side, because they always had the reverser that was going to decrease the landing distance even further. The problem, though, was that on the Boeing 737-700, the performance calculation actually did include the use of thrust reverser. But this hadn't been properly communicated to the crews. That was shown by several interviews with other Southwest crews after this incident. So it's very likely that these pilots actually thought that, yeah, we only have 40 feet to spare, but we also have the thrust reverser, so that's going to give us another healthy margin to stop. Now, before we get into the accident sequence of this flight, I just want to share this short message from my sponsor who makes it possible for me to make these kind of videos for you. If you, like me, love a great documentary, you have to check out today's sponsor, which is CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream is a high-quality subscription streaming service with thousands of titles from some of the best filmmakers in the world. It is literally the Netflix for nerds, the Hulu for history buffs, or the Disney Plus for the scientists in us. Curiosity Stream releases a host of new shows every single week, including some exclusive originals that you can only find there. I recently started following a great series called Engineering the Future, where you get to follow pioneers within engineering and how they think that we can create a better future through technology. It's really fascinating. Now, the most amazing thing here is that Curiosity Stream is extremely affordable. It's only $20 per year for regular people, but for you who are following my channel and use the link in the description here below, which is curiositystream.com slash mentorpilot, and use the coupon code mentorpilot, you get another 25% off that price, bringing it down to only $14.99 per year. That's $1.25 per month, which is incredible. Now back to the video. Now let's talk a little bit about Chicago Midway Airport. The airport had five operational runways at the time of the accident. Two of the runways were parallel, running in the direction 040 degrees and the opposite of 220 degrees. And three parallel runways going in the direction of 130 degrees and 310 degrees. The runway that this crew was preparing to land on was the center one of the runways facing 310 degrees. Now the problem that Midway had was that it was built basically within a square and outside of the airport perimeter was a lot of housing and highways. This meant that the normal runway safety area that is supposed to extend for about a thousand feet beyond any of the active runways could not be achieved. Instead they had gotten an exemption and the runway safety area was only 82 feet. But the FAA had asked the airport during the years leading up to the accident if they could see if there was any alternative to the runway safety area that could be implemented. And they had started looking into a system called EMAS, which stands for Engineering Material Arresting System. This is basically a type of concrete material that will collapse when an aircraft rolls out over it. And because it's collapsing, it will start to create a lot of, of braking onto the wheels, so it will potentially stop an aircraft much quicker than it would be if it was rolling out onto normal soil. At time 1805, the aircraft initiated its descent down towards Chicago Midway Airport. During the descent, the pilots were discussing the runway conditions, and it's pretty obvious that they weren't really happy with it. They were also discussing whether or not it was prudent for them to start using the outer brake system for the very first time in conditions like this. But the captain eventually said, yeah, we are going to do it, but I am going to be monitoring the system very closely. And if it doesn't work as I like it to, I'm just going to apply maximum manual braking myself. At time 1833, the aircraft was cleared to descend down to 10,000 feet, and they were also cleared to enter a holding pattern, because there was now snow clearing taking place down on the runway. As the aircraft entered the holding pattern, the crew took the latest weather and the runway conditions and it was pretty similar to what they had already received. The tailwind was still 8 knots, so the landing calculations that they had already done was still accurate and the crew felt confident to continue with the approach. Now before we go into the approach and landing, I just want to stop here and explain to you the three different phases that all pilots need to get right in order for a successful landing to occur. The first phase is actually the approach phase. That's where we have to come in, we need to be stabilized. That means that the uh, aircraft needs to have the correct configuration, we need to be on the correct speed, we need to be on the correct path, and we need to have all of our checklists complete. 
That's because it's really important for us to have all of these parameters set so that we can continue to monitor the aircraft as we're coming in in a stable way so that we can see that the next phase of the landing is going to be successful. The second phase is the landing. Right? This means that the aircraft crosses the threshold at approximately 50 feet and then that we have, according to the FAA, between 1,000 and 1,500 feet of air distance. So we overfly the very first part of the runway so that we get the aircraft to touch down exactly on the touchdown zone markings. Ideally, that is a beam, the pop is, can be a little bit before that as well and it could be a little bit after, but we need to get the aircraft to touch down within that zone. And that's important because we need to get into the third phase of the landing, which is the stopping phase. Now, providing that the first two phases were successful, we touch down where we're supposed to be on the touchdown zone marking, then the next part is to get the aircraft to stop. And we do that with the help of our brakes, our spoilers on the wings. The spoilers are supposed to come up so that it dumps all of the lift from the wings, so the whole weight of the aircraft comes down onto the brakes. That means that as we now apply maximum braking or as much braking as we need, we get as much effect out of our brakes as possible. And as soon as we get main gear touchdown, we're supposed to activate our thrust reversers. And we do that with a couple of levers on the front of our thrust levers. Now the way the thrust reversers works is that as we select them, that will initiate the unlocking sequence of the thrust reverser sleeves. So in the case of the 737, that means that a couple of doors will move backward and these blocker doors will then redirect the fan flow from the engines to go outwards and forwards. This is what actually generates the opposite force that gives us the deceleration, but it takes a while from when you select the thrust reversers until this initial sequence is done. And during that time, you cannot continue to select more reverse thrust because the mechanism is not ready yet. Once the thrust reverses are set in place, then you can select as much thrust reverse as you need, up to a maximum of about 82% and one. If all of these things are done correctly, so you touch down, the spoilers comes up, the thrust reverses are selected to the interlock, you start braking either with the auto brake system or with manual braking if needed and then you quickly select max reverse thrust then you get the most efficient deceleration out of the aircraft. Now I mentioned that you need to be fairly quick with selecting the thrust reverses and the reason for that is because when an aircraft comes in on approach the engines utilize something called approach idle. That means that the idle of the engines are quite high but about five seconds after we touch down, the logic changes from approach idle to ground idle, where the engine N1 is allowed to spool back to much lower value. And if you haven't selected the thrust reverses initially, then the engines might spool back to that lower value, and when you select them, it's not only going to take the seconds it takes for the uh, thrust reverser sleeves to unlock, but then it's going to take you much longer time to actually get the engines to accelerate back up again to achieve that maximum reverse thrust. And this is really important to remember. When it comes to the brakes of the aircraft, they function very similar to those of a modern car, which means that there is an anti-skid system connected to each individual wheel. This means that as the pilots or the auto brake system applies brake pressure, then the anti-skid system will feel whether or not the wheels start skidding. And if there's an indication that they start to skid, as in start to stop, then the brake pressure will be automatically released on that wheel until it starts spinning again, and then brake pressure will be reapplied, thereby giving the absolute most efficient braking. The problem of course comes when you have so bad braking action that as soon as any type of brake pressure is applied to the wheels, they start skidding. In that case, you might not get almost any braking out of the wheels, and the only thing stopping the aircraft is the drag of the aircraft together with the thrust reverses. At time 1854, Southwest Flight 1248 starts receiving its final vectors in for the ILS approach runway 31 center. The pilot starts extending flaps as per normal procedures, they start to uh, slow the aircraft down and they eventually get cleared to intercept the ILS. As they are established on the localizer, they receive the updated braking action figures, which are just like before, fair in the beginning of the runway and 
core towards the end. They also received an updated wind of 110 degrees at 11 knots, which is about the same type of tailwind as they had during their uh, calculations. And then they continue to descend along the glide slope. They get changed over to the midway tower controller and once they check in with the tower controller, the aircraft is fully stabilized on speed with the checklist complete and ready for landing. At time 19.12 and 28 seconds, the aircraft touches down exactly where it's supposed to be on the touchdown zone markings at a speed of about 124 knots. The touchdown was quite firm and immediately after the aircraft touched down, the uh, captain reaches over for the thrust reverses, he extends them and then tries to pull them backwards to get full reverse thrust. But they're initially a bit stuck. Probably for the reason that I explained before, that it takes a while for the thrust reverse sleeves to actually get into position. Anyway, as he's doing this, he's now focusing his attention towards the braking. Because remember, they have auto brake max selected and this is the first time that they've ever used the auto brake system. So he is expecting, watching and seeing what the system is doing. And initially he says that he can feel the anti-skid system working, as in cycling in and out. And then it feels like it doesn't apply any braking anymore and both of the pilots says that they experience it like the aircraft is accelerating down the runway. Likely they're actually not accelerating it's just that a lack of deceleration or a decrease of the deceleration rate can sometimes be felt like an acceleration. Anyway the uh, captain is now focusing on getting his max manual braking in and trying to get the aircraft to stop but as he's doing so he's completely forgot about the thrust reverses. The first officer has also noticed the decrease in deceleration and he is looking over at the captain and he says, are you, are you jumping on there? Are you jumping on the brakes? And then he looks down and he realizes that the thrust reverses are still in idle. He reaches over, removes the captain's hand from the thrust reverses and selects max reverse thrust. This happens about 18 seconds after touchdown, which is a long time during a landing on a slippery runway. Now both pilots are applying max manual braking but the captain realizes that this is not going to be enough. He exclaims, it ain't going man and all right keep it straight as the aircraft continues past the end of the runway at a speed of about 53 knots. The aircraft now continues through the very short safety area then through a blast fence and through a navigational antenna over an airport perimeter road and then past the perimeter fence of the airport before it goes on to a very busy highway outside of the airport area. Unfortunately on that highway there is a family traveling in a northbound car that collides with the aircraft as it's coming to a stop on the highway. As soon as the aircraft has come to a complete stop, the crew initiates an emergency evacuation and all of the crew and passengers manage to escape the aircraft. Unfortunately, inside of the car that was hit of the aircraft, a small child is killed and one of the traveling adults severely injured. The investigation into this accident came to some really interesting conclusions. First of all, it was found that the crew shouldn't have started the approach in the first place, given the fact that the braking action was reported as poor on part of the runway and that they only really could take five knots of tailwind if that was the case. It also found that it's likely that the captain was distracted by the use of the auto brake system, which made him forget to continue to select the thrust reverses after they had been activated. If instead the thrust reverses would have been immediately selected to max reverse thrust instead of waiting those 18 seconds and maintained until stopping was assured, it was shown in later calculations that the aircraft would have been able to stop within the available runway distance. There also seemed to be a general lack of training when it came to Winthrop's procedures within Southwest Airlines at the time, because when interviewed, a lot of the pilots indicated that they did not know that you had to use the most limiting type of braking action in order to calculate the max tailwind figure that you can use. And also that a lot of them did not know that the Boeing 737-700 actually had the thrust reverser credit included in the landing distance performance calculation. But probably the most eye-catching thing in this whole investigation was the fact that the FAA had not mandated all operators to do a proper in-flight landing performance calculation prior to landing. This incident led the FAA to send out a recommendation to the industry that everyone needed to do this and that they should put a 15% safety margin onto that calculation. Chicago Midway Airport was also recommended to implement the EMAS system, the Emergency Material Arresting System. And some calculations after the accident indicated that if EMAS would have been in place in the limited safety area that was available, 
that would have been enough to stop the aircraft even when it left the runway at 53 knots. At the end of each video, I always tend to say that this accident has made the aviation industry safer. And that is actually the case with this accident as well. However, runway excursions are one of the few accident types out there that is actually getting worse. We are having more runway excursions every year than we had before. And this just shows that we as pilots need to be very, very careful and threat aware when it comes to landing, especially on slippery runways or with tailwind. We need to do proper pre-landing assessments of the runways we're going into. We need to be threat aware when it comes to the three different phases of the landing. And we need to be conservative when we're going into any type of runway to make sure that we are able to stop the aircraft before the end of the runway. Now, threat management and leadership is something I teach in the courses I've started doing. And if you are interested in joining one of these courses going forward, well then go to mentorpilot.com and sign up your email address. I would love to see you on one of my next courses. Now, check out this video next, which is a truly crazy story, which I think you're gonna enjoy. I hope that you have subscribed to my new channel, Mentor Now, where I handle more kind of topical items that has happened. And if you wanna support the work that I do on the channel, then consider becoming part of my lovely Patreon family or buy yourself some merch. Have an absolutely fantastic day and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.